We're sorry for the inconvenience. We have a delay of a train in front of you with stuck brakes. You will be routed via the local track. Thank you for your cooperation. Sorry for the inconvenience. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Jack from Manhattan. I'm born and raised here in Manhattan, born in 1986. In the 1990s, when I was in middle school, I started getting very interested in graffiti. I quickly realized that graffiti culture in New York City is all about knowing your history. As I acquired knowledge, I learned of two names, a legendary and notorious pair of brothers, Smith and his younger brother, Sane. He is, he's one of the people that typified not just New York graffiti, but graffiti worldwide. And if you think about it, really, at that point, I don't think that Sainer Smith ever went outside New York. And they were already world known pre-internet. That's big, pre-fucking internet. Motherfuckers in Paris and Holland who were writing knew who they were. London, they were the people that, you know, Banksy should write a check to. <laughs> Sane in action. Uh, this is like two rare pictures. This is uh, going into the yard. This is actually in the yard already. Um, he gave me these two pictures. Smith, along with Sane together, there isn't going to be ever a duo like that in New York City history. And, you know, Smith got certified when he got his tag was in a Michael Jackson video for I'm Bad. So that was his certification. And everyone, if, if, if real graph people know what I'm talking about. What neighborhood were you and your brother born and raised in? We were born and raised in Washington Heights, Upper Manhattan. Washington Heights, New York City, Uptown Manhattan. So that's past, starts at 156 and it ends at Dykeman. Clyde, these were all like legends that lived actually up the block from us. And these were like our Washington Heights legends. Washington Heights has a very special story. We grew up in the 70s. My mom was an immigrant, so she had uh, a lot of immigrant ideas. I am Helga, Helga Smith. I was born in a country that doesn't exist anymore, in East Germany. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That's like my brother. Smith's my brother. Saying he knows, yeah. Saying was my brother. That was like my best friend. So, you know, we all ate at his mom's kitchen together. They looked after me, and their mother looked after me too. Um, so I was like their little brother. I was the youngest out of all of them. J O T, Elijah B. But everyone calls me Jot. My my tag was J O T Jot. What years did you start getting into graffiti? Let me see. I'll say like 84, 85. And this is like our first tags actually. We used to tag. This is us just beginning to, to write. We just getting like our first spray can. This is where we first learned how to start tagging. So this you see, we were like toys when we first started. It was always tags. I saw some of the earliest tags. The earliest things I can remember were Mike 171 and Freddy 173. What do you write on the wall when you write on it? Me 163, Raby 954, a lot of things. What does that all mean, those numbers? My building number is 954, the 163rd Street. Me from the for from me 163. A lot of things, like Taki 183, lives on 183rd Street, so he write Taki, that's his nickname, he ain't 183rd Street. Well, first it got started as just uh, among a peer group, a group of kids just started as a kind of competition. They wanted to see, the, uh, the New York Times, I think, is greatly responsible for it by giving it publicity. They gave this big story to this kid, Taki, and even though I doubt if these kids read the Times, it must have gotten to them that this story came out and this guy achieved some kind of notoriety. But it didn't really click until I went to high school and every day I had to take the twos and fives and saw all the pieces. That was just mind blowing. The twos and fives used to go to the two yard. It would be like a masterpiece art gallery of burners from all these dudes from the Bronx and Brooklyn with Death Wild styles. Yeah, I'd taken the trains before, but that was just like constant exposure. I always look at graffiti and hip hop and hardcore and even like the metal scene 
because there was like, it was kids from, from music scenes, really. My name is Gavin Van Vlack. I used to write knots. I was, uh, I was a partner with, uh, with Sane and Smith. It was all kind of street culture. So it was this amalgamation of graffiti. And it was just this huge kind of melting pot of cultures. Cause it was, it was street culture. Sane knew the whole lyrics to Grandmaster Flash, the message and Hey DJ. And that's how I got cool with Sane, because he knew all the lyrics to Hey DJ, play that song, keep on dancing, dancing. He knew every single lyric. So that was impressive to me. I was like, yo, how does Anglo Saxon know all these lyrics? So that's how we started bonding also. So what years did you and your brother start writing? It was from 84 to 90. And what do you write? Saint Smith. I go by the name of Lady Pink, and I've been an artist for 43 years now. I started at the age of 15. By the age of 16, I was painting on the subways. I'd been married to Roger Smith for about 30 years now. In a few months, it will be 30 years. We met back in 93, about three years after he had lost his brother. I thought it was an accident because, you know, the way they found him, um, yeah, the way they found them, it felt like I wanted to think it was an accident, you know, because I knew he was a daredevil. He's a legend. He had balls the size of fucking Wyoming. The Koch pieces? Mayor Koch. For God's sake, the Koch pieces on 23rd Street alone were fucking, you know, a statement. He used to climb the bridge. He lived next to the George Washington Bridge, and he used to climb the bridge all the time. Like, he took that picture. That's him standing on top of a bridge, you know? He was my son. He had uh, an older brother, Roger, and a uh, sister, Monica, and he was the youngest. Did their father live in the apartment growing up with them? No, unfortunately not. He uh, <clears throat> decided that uh, he didn't want a family after all, after David was uh, two years old. So David had very little uh, fatherly input, and uh, that was kind of unfortunate, but uh, that's the way things are. I had a little crew uptown where I was at called NAW, Nasty Ass Riders. And it was just two of my friends, three of my friends, but we had a little, we're making like a little noise in our neighborhood. And Sane lived like not that far from us. So he knew I was getting into it. So then like he started getting into it because he saw that I was making some friction. That was our crew in AEW. That's me. Sane took this picture of me actually. So during the weekends, we started practicing bombing, whatever, tagging, um, going to trains, going to train yards. But it, mainly we're just going in our neighborhoods because we lived in the Heights, had these buildings. We could go under the buildings that had these flat walls. So he used to practice first on these walls, like hidden jewels in, under in the heights, like little these little caves in the heights that he practiced first. Ja told me about this wall. He was like, there are some spots in Wash Heights that Sane used to practice on before we started hitting trains. And then we started branching out, because once we got a little name myself in the, in the neighborhood, then started branching out. And everyone knew in my crew, in my neighborhood, that I was my boy because I used to protect Sane. I was like his bodyguard, you know? And well, and that's how we used to get people. Like he was the Anglo-Saxon, I was the, the, you know, the black guy. And we're walking to stores, and everyone's looking at me. And he's over there like racking up and shit. So that was our thing. It was like, back then, there wasn't that many like close black and white best friends rolling around New York City. Smith was bombing on his own. He wasn't bombing with saying yet. I think uh, Roger had already started and uh, somehow David got uh, involved as well. It was quite prevalent, obviously. I mean, uh, you, you know from the 80s uh, how the uh, subways looked like. Welcome to the New York subway. That's what the vandals do. It, it must have been exciting for the kids. Beautiful graffiti everywhere.
I didn't notice graffiti until at the age of 12. We took a school trip to the Bronx Zoo. So we took an elevated train and that was my first experience on an elevated train. And I saw a Lee Hall car. When we got off at the station for the Bronx Zoo in, up in the Bronx, uh, the doors closed and the train pulled out and it was a whole car with trees and characters and letters. And I'm like, Wow, these train people really decorate their trains so beautifully. This is gorgeous. Had no idea it was graffiti whatsoever. I was only 12 years old, but that's the first time I noticed graffiti. We used to take pictures. This is a, a picture that I did for a piece that he did in back of this uh, Bernard school. And that's the a picture I took of him. Um, and I did this, I watched him do this whole piece here. And he loved the place where it was at because it was all surrounded by trees and he just wanted a peace of mind. I think we got it from Style Wars, from like just taking pictures and making albums of trains and shit. Yeah, that's pretty much how I got into photography, because I was just taking pictures of trains, because we got it off Henry. Henry Chalfant! We were nothing but a pain in the Henry Chalfant, but he loved the culture so much and was so enthralled with it that he felt it needed to be documented. You can't imagine how interesting it was because it was mysterious and you really didn't know who was doing it, and. It was new and you couldn't believe that people were actually getting into the tunnels or wherever they did it. Hello, I'm in my interview. Uh, my name is Henry Chalfant and starting in the mid-70s I began to document graffiti on the trains. Did I, I watch Style Wars when it aired? Of course, everyone watched it when it aired. We only had like a handful of channels and at the time and it was huge that one of the more serious, respectable channels, you know, commissioned Henry Chalfant to do this documentary, Style Wars, which was right on the money. And because we all loved and respected Henry, he got unusual access to some of the secret spots, the layups, the train yards, and all of that. I was able to film some of the very, very realistic things that went down in the early 80s. Style Wars is a documentary film that I made along with uh, a filmmaker named Tony Silver. Um, he was the filmmaker, I was like the, we would call it the anthropologist. Um, I knew connections and uh, I had connections to this whole graffiti world. It was intriguing and in addition to that the art that the kids were doing on the trains I found it to be very exciting and, and uh, very new in terms of of image and uh, form and rhythm and everything. I think it was kind of the, maybe you could call it the golden age. We were like, yeah, let's take, let's take these shots at these trains, build up our, our collection, go to the one hour photo on Canal and make our little booklets. So it was like almost a, like our baseball cards, but for graffiti writers. The goal during that era was just to get into side subway art too. Subway Art 1 was the Bible, so we monumented everyone that was in there. Case, Dandi, Scene. We're like, all right, these guys are official, because that was the first book that actually came out, glorifying graffiti. Subway Art is a book which uh, Martha Cooper and I made together. Um, we had very different styles of photography. She was a photojournalist, and she took pictures uh, with trains passing through an environment of the city, whereas I took pictures just highlighting the art. We both had tried to make our own book separately. We were kind of in competition, and we both failed miserably to get our proposals accepted in New York. So we decided to collaborate, which was great because then um, you know, we shared the work. We, we back in those days, it was pre Pre-digital, we just, we had a typewriter, we typed up captions and typed up the text and stories and the glossary and all those things which are in the book and laid it out. That's the beginning of cutting and pasting. That's where I think people got cutting and pasting from because we used to... Which I got like this, click, 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 click. And then I pasted them together. My method for taking pictures of the trains is to stand on the platform with the sun coming over my back and when the train on the opposite side comes into the station, I take pictures, taking them in series, because I'm about 15 or 20 feet away from the train, and with a 50 millimeter lens, I have to take, to get the whole car in, four or five 
overlapping shots, which then when I get them to my studio as prints, I can cut them and splice them together. You understand? Like, every graffiti writer wants to get inside subway art because that solidified you're in the crew, you're in the game, that made you famous. They were both made between 1981 and 1984. Henry was one of those people that, he was a big brother figure or father figure to a lot of kids in the graffiti scene because a lot of kids came from, you know, one parent homes. We were latchkeys. You have to imagine being a kid in New York that was born in the late 60s and early 70s. You saw the birth of graffiti. You watched it get better and better throughout the 70s and into the 80s. And right when you finally become old enough to really start going on some missions, a documentary comes out and then a book comes out. And keep in mind, during this time, there was no internet, there was no social media. We only had newspapers, magazines, radio, TV, and movies. So to see your graffiti or hear of your name was a very big deal. You couldn't just take a picture, upload it for the world to see. It was a very time consuming process, especially with film cameras. Sometimes finished rolls of film would sit in drawers for days, weeks, months, even years before people finally got around to developing them and looking at the photos. It was much more of a process at the time. At this time, I had a sculpture studio where I was working, and it was on Grand Street, the number 64 Grand Street, between West Broadway and Worcester Street. The studio was established as kind of a graffiti museum amongst the youth at that time. And so they would come to my studio. Yo, all Gloves. that stuff was mine, the bolt cutters, the camera, <laughs> the cans, everything. Got lost, everything. And it became quite a sort of traditional routine just to come there after school or even for the odd truant person to come in the morning and just sit and go through the albums and draw. There's just some cars what we did, some twelves, yeah. KVs. Yo, I heard somebody rag these cars. I don't nah, know. I don't, nah, that's a story. But someone mm. rag, someone ragged this wall already. To what we did on Houston. They got up here. Nah, they didn't get up there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I met Hendry because Sane surprised me and took me to his studio, and we made a couple of trips there because him and Sane actually had a good relationship. I met Roger before, and at some point he he came and he brought his his brother to the studio, and that's when I met David. The two of them were they're quite introverted. And um, they're not, they were not groupies. They were very discreet and they didn't talk much. I learned as time went on that, that they were doing these crazy wild daredevil pieces, which I, by that time, you know, and I never really went to take those pictures. I wasn't outfitted to get out in a boat or something and go out in the harbor to to take, really get those pictures. Can you tell me about the early days of St. Smith Graffiti Missions? The first two years or so, we didn't have a mentor. It's not really brought up that often, but a lot of kids had mentors, older guys, slightly older than them, that knew the ropes and showed and instructed and you know, taught all the things, the culture and how to rack pain and how to make a marker. We didn't have that uh, for the first couple of years. We just didn't know anybody. We didn't really meet anybody. We both went to high school outside of our neighborhood, so we didn't know any of the local guys, which wasn't all that good because once we blew up, a lot of guys, I don't want to say they got jealous, but they just did not like the competition. I always felt that to get in this game, you had to be up. And I made sure we were up. When I realized what they were doing and they were getting into trouble, that certainly bothered me. Back in 1986, the Van Squad actually knocked on my door and said, hey, I, I want to talk to my mom. 
my brother was there and he was like, uh, you're gonna have to talk to her a week later. So he's like, all right, I'll come back in a week. So we had a week to clear out. So even back in 86, the head of the Vanna Squad, he knew who we were. This was only after two years of painting. And he came and talked to my mom, sat her down, said, oh, you know, your son's gonna get in trouble and blah, blah, blah. And he tried to be the good cop and that didn't really work. I would have preferred if they could find a way of doing it legally. As a matter of fact, after they did get into trouble a few times, I did my best to not exactly discourage them, but trying to find ways of them do, being able to do it without getting into trouble, if they would have legal walls or uh, be allowed to do some somewhere. But that wasn't the attraction uh, for them. A uh, part of the risk was the attraction, the motivation. You know, if they had been allowed to do it somewhere, they probably, they may not have been uh, willing to do it or uh, not have gotten that kind of enjoyment out of it. I think they went, you know, when they really went off is when me and Sane started doing the, the buckets. And I wanted to say on record, we're like the inventors of the paint buckets because we found them together. I, a lot of guys are considered like buckets, buckets cheating, but it's like when you get to really prime out a piece and lay down a foundation for it, it's just, and, and you get to, you know, the time you get to put into it and it's, it's just really kind of cool. Paint bucket. This is another abandoned under a building that we did together side by side. Same was really, as you see, the, the technique of the lining of his outline. He was really good at his outlines. I wasn't as good as mine, so sometimes he actually did them for me. As you see, Sam was like, oh shit, this is, the, this, this is the new wave right here. So during that time, that's when they exploded. We always used a four inch brush. You, br you used the brush? Yes. And the bucket paint? Yes. And it would save money, because you know they couldn't rack hands all the time. So the buckets was like the way to go. And we found buckets, you know, we used to find buckets from the MTA. Like these are buckets also. And Sane actually used to do these for me. He did the outline for that. A beautiful photo. Uh, this is all, these two are paint buckets, the paint bucket era, as you see the same joint. So this is when we started doing um, freight trains. And this train still comes up. I still, someone still sent me this joint. So now we're down with x band 156, NAW, that was my crew. So now we're like, we're busting up doing these together. And that was, a, this became famous because we're, not many people were doing freights. In 86, we both discovered a spot down in Canal that sold paint for 79 cents a can, these green spray cans. The greenies, first it was the greenies, I think, as I remember. And then I think that's what they're really known for is the greenies. That's when they got with John. And that's when, it, that's when it became a problem. Me and Shane were real big fans of 156. We're really big fans of John. 156 was like the next posse next to us that was making some real damage, some real noise. John was to us the leader of 156. And the way he put up his abstract art, and he was up a lot on the one train, he was active. And we're uptown and we're like, yo, how can we make some noise like these guys? Cause those guys, and we lived next to the layup, 175th layup was same spot. So he had an advantage cause he lived two blocks away from the ship. This one was, I think like 117th street, big time. Everybody on the corner was selling crack. Can you tell me the story of how you met John 156 and that helped you gain recognition? We happened to be be both going to 175th in summer of 86. The one line had closed down, so he had moved over to hitting the double A layups at 175th. And I think we started a couple weeks before him, but then once he started going, we figured, oh shit, he's going every Saturday at like 11 o'clock. And I think within a week or two, we met John 156. We happened to go down a lane and it was just like car after car after car of him doing throw-ups. He would do a, a, a throw-up stretching from end to end. I mean, this was very impressive. And we went into that lane and we saw a couple of cars like that. So we were like, oh shit, that's, that's him. And he was already almost done 
and he was at the far end of the, and he came running down the lane. Say, yo, what's your right, what's your right, what's your right? And, <laughs> you know, we were like, yo, St. Smith, no problem, you know. And he's like, oh, okay, stay out of my lane. <laughs> so we were like, hey, no problem. Because we would prefer, and we did that for a couple months straight, every week we would hit every set. So our stuff would pull out where his stuff would pull over to the D-line and get buffed pretty quick. He was, you know, the graffiti writer extraordinaire. He was the king, and the MTA took notice, so they actually saw his stuff. It looked to us that they saw his stuff and took it out of service and buffed it. Vendetta. That's what it seemed like. MTA was washing the cars. To get this city back on its feet. It was Koch. Well, it is one of the quality of life offenses, and uh, you can't just take one of those quality of life offenses. It's like a three-card Monty and uh, pickpocketing and uh, shoplifting and uh, uh, graffiti defacing our uh, public and private walls. Escape this delightful decoration. Delightful? Well, that's horrible. Koch, as he describes in, in Style Wars, was going after what he called the quality of life offenses, in which he included graffiti. And it was under his watch that they started enclosing the yards. Uh, you know, so it was harder to get in and harder to get out. It made it more difficult to paint the trains. The acid solution is sprayed on subway cars in this exotic urban car wash. 55 gallons per train in the costly battle against graffiti. The buff was when they ran the cars, the subway cars, through uh, an acid wash. They would throw some acid onto the actual trains and then just wash it down. Uh, they had been doing this since the, the 70s, so it was not a new thing. The whole thing about the clean trains in late 84, they started seriously trying to keep one particular line clean. I hate graffiti. They bought totally new stainless steel cars, put it on the four line, and then did their best to keep that line clean. And then they just went line by line by line trying to keep it clean. I remember one time we got rated 175th, and it was fucking chaos. It was like cops were popping up like whack-a-mole. There was a bunch of us on that bomb. Smith brought buckets to that one. Wasn't a good idea. Yeah, I had a long running like problem with that because I ended up pulling a cop into a connection hub and he caught it in the face. When these cars leave the paint room or get washed, they look new. And we've documented that the average car lasts about a week before it's painted up again. One week. A dramatic scenario staged by the MTA shows what could happen to a graffiti artist as he decorates a subway car. Is it possible then that such dedicated artists will abandon their natural habitat to avoid being bitten by a dog? By May, of, May 12th of 1989 was the last uh, bombed car, the CC train, that they pulled out of service. From then on, it was just, uh, everything was clean. It really helps to see your own work Graffiti writers, at least New Yorkers, needed that instant gratification of doing it, but you're also being on the platform. There was a whole culture to that that a lot of people just don't really get in other cities. They, they see it like once or twice and then it gets cleaned. Seeing it for like a couple months at a time, up, you know, even a year or two later, that's just amazing. Once they start taking out line by line by line, we were like, eventually they're just gonna clean the whole system. So we would just start hitting other spots. And of course you want to hit the best spot. That just seemed logical. I guess we did enough high profile areas and that had not really been done before in, in your craft. You know, people had definitely hit good spots, but I guess just not enough to interest everybody. So when did you hit the Brooklyn Bridge? 